They tied him to the stairwell and shot him. That was for murder on UK soil. I'm going to assault. We all got into the position and the big um, distraction. Go, go, go. 11 minutes to clear the 54, 56 rooms. We rescue 19 hostages, five terrorists perish. Rusty, how are you, sir? Very well, mate. Just preparing for a funeral tomorrow. Oh, bad luck. Someone close or a military colleague? Yeah, military colleague. You see the guys on there behind me? Not the one behind me with no gloves, but the next one back. My mate. Oh. We'll, we'll be there tomorrow to see, to see him. Yes. Are we, are we able to say his name or is that not a good idea? Um. I won't, I won't bother to lose, um, you know, he's not a well-known guy. So it's probably better. Um, let's just say Jerry. Okay. Well, I hope it goes all right. Yeah. And uh, we make, yeah. make it work. Yes. I think as we get older, isn't it, we know, we know more and more uh, of our oppos are... Um, Go into the big, big piss up in the sky. That's it, mate. Yes. We'll be there one day. Yes. Rusty, I wanted to ask you about your younger years, because I, I I bet you've done, I, I bet, excuse me. <coughs> I bet you've been asked about the embassy siege to death, haven't you? More or less, mate. <laughs> But for me, the story never changes. I've still got my memories. Um, in fact, we're doing um, a crowd cast on the 4th and 5th of May, coming up 21st. Uh, and that is for the 41st anniversary of the siege. That's coming up on the 4th and 5th of May on a crowd cast. So if people want to go anywhere near that, then all they have to do is go onto my Twitter, Rusty Furman, or my Facebook, Rusty Furman. And they'll pick up the details, where it is, what it is, and what it's about. Very simple. Yeah, got you. So, growing up, Rusty, what what was what was childhood like? If you, sorry, this is sounding like an interview, and I don't do interviews, but I am genuinely interested. What what leads someone into joining the army, and then then getting their green berry, and then going for the elite special forces? So, yeah, it's um, uh, growing up wasn't particularly happy. It, you know, I mentioned it all in my book, the regiment, 15 years in the SAS. Um, it was hard. I didn't really know any parents. I think I'm a guy who's never sent a mother or Father's Day card in his life. Um, so, and I was five foot two and weighed about seven stone. And I was a dead ringer for the bullies who wanted to bully me. Okay, it lasted for a while. And then um, took that as part of growing up. Didn't like it. Um, I had some friends who were very close friends. I've got one or two in Carlisle that are still very close friends to this day. And that's how it happened. I just wanted, I didn't want to go in the army. That's the definite. Um, but at 15, I was taken to the recruiting office and ended up in the juniors, junior leaders regiment, Royal Artillery, um, down in Nuneaton, Bramcote, Nuneaton, where I spent a couple of years there and hated the first three months. I then found my way into a tracksuit because I was a bit of a footballer. I was starting to grow, you know, with the, the physical training and stuff. And within a couple of years, I'd grown about seven or eight inches, and I was up there at five foot ten, 
not to be bullied anymore. But I did um, represent going through the system. There was only myself left for Carlisle at the same time that I knew. And once I was there, it was stand on your own feet or fall by the wayside. However, football saved me um, a lot because I played for everybody. I sometimes was playing four or five games a week. You know, I couldn't get enough of football. And then, um, so that takes me on through my boy's service. Went back home occasionally because some of my friends, I used to go and stay with them. But when there was a break, a summer break maybe or something, I might go up to Hull, Beverly, with a few friends of mine. And very rarely did I go home because when I left there, I knew there wasn't anything there for me apart from the old friend. And as I say, we're still in touch to this day, all those years later. Was it 55 years now, something like that? Um, and really, that's how the early part of my life was. It was once, I'm quite a friendly sort of person to be upset me. Um, made friends easily. The discipline I found hard because I came from no discipline. Um, I worked on that. And finally, you know, I left boys' soldiers, uh, boys service at approximately 17 and a half years of age. I'd grown, I matured, I learned an awful lot about life and that life doesn't owe you anything. You sit back, well, you can still be sat back to this day. What you have to do is go out and grab something. What I did is I went to the unit after that that I wanted to. And that's really where my football within the army took off. I had a reason to be there. And it wasn't all about being military at that age, I can tell you now. I found that I could do what I wanted to do and get paid for it, enjoy it. And that's what I did. I was at what I might call in those days, absolute soldier. Yes. Did you get the anger as a kid, Rusty? Sorry? Did you get the anger as a kid? I used, yeah, I used to get this thing where it's like you could bully me a bit and I, I just, I'd let it go and then, then I'd let it go. And then third time, I'd just snap them. I'd, I'd knock you out and then I've done that. and then you wouldn't bully me again and I, I, I can't really describe it. it it's definitely part of having a broken childhood yeah um, for a lot of reasons you know um, but yeah I've been through that um, and as much as you want I remember the bad times they come flooding back to you and you couldn't you know, and then things change. Uh, and I'm no different. It's exactly what happened to me. What's it like being a junior leader, mate? Because that's that that's that's hell of a young age, isn't it, to join the army? Yeah, I joined at 15, um, 15 and a half, thereabouts. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know what the junior leaders meant. You know, I, I had no idea. It was rather artillery to me. Junior leader, um, how did I get into the junior leaders? You know, at school, I wasn't, I've still got <laughs> some of my certificates from school, you know, stood in the corridor more than the classroom in those days, you know what I mean? Um, and I had no interest, really, apart from maybe geography, woodwork and metalwork I used to like um, at school. But then I went and sat an exam in Carlisle and ended up in the junior leaders. I've, I've no idea how they marked it. Maybe they got my paper mixed up with something. I don't know. But that's how it happened. And then, as I say, I started to learn, um, being fed well, being exercised well, and I got to enjoy it, having spent the first three months. just If I had £50, that's what it cost in 1965. 
I'd had 50 pounds, or somebody would have given me it, I'd have gone out of the army. I ended up spending 27 years in the army. So work that one out. It's like not. Yes. Did you have any childhood heroes, Rusty? If you ask me about my childhood, is the a... first thing that comes in my mind is Tarzan. He, it, it was, it, it was, he was just my life. Um, I'm a footballer. Um, we had a school there where we had three or four England schoolboy internationals in Tarzan. Incredible amount um, in those days. Um, and I just wanted to be them, but I knew I couldn't because I wasn't big enough. These were six foot guys at age 15. They all made it to some degree. Um, and I have another, you know, um, one in particular I followed was a guy called George McVitie, played for Carlisle, England school boys. And then there was a few others. Um, and they, sports personalities in football only, were my heroes, quite a lot of them. That's all I wanted to do. That was my only interest in life, nothing else. And so I followed the sport, and they were the heroes for me. You were a good football player, weren't you? Did I did I gather that? I, I, I ended up representing the British Army and BAOR, which is a good standard. It's just, in amateur football, it's as high as you're going to get. Um, so, yeah, I played for the British Army. I got my colours. Played for BOR, British Army over the Rhine in those days. Played for them as well. And um, every unit I went to, including the SAS, where I was captain of the team, where we had the best team in the county. We won all five trophies in one season. You know, um, so it followed me all the way through. <coughs> and really, yeah. my start... And it, I was played my last game of football, I think, when I was 60. So it just shows you, doesn't it? I started at a really young age, but still wanted to play at age 60. Hey, we should start an all-star internet elite forces legends match. <laughs> let's, let's call them legends instead of... <laughs> I'll be... Um... I'll be the uh, the guy that gives out the oranges at halftime. We can't lose that one, can we? Because we'll be in charge of it. So whatever <laughs> happens, we win. <laughs> yeah, we'll bring in artillery. That'll be your job. Yeah. What's it like then in in two nine? Because obviously the 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 commando force is here in um, Plymouth. Yeah. Um, do I mean? They're big guns, aren't they? What do they fire for? Is it 17 or 18 miles? No, it's all changed nowadays from when I was in there. Um, you know, the pack howitzers really, um, they're to support the Royal Marines. Um, so I did my commander course. I volunteered for that, obviously. Um, and I still ended up playing football for the gunners um, and the army when I was down in Plymouth. Um, but obviously it was getting a bit much because I was supposed to be a soldier. So whilst it was nice to represent the army, I then, um, they then took me and put me on training wing where, you know, I've always been fit. And so I went on training wing. Um, I had to go into the SAS eventually where I spent the last 18 months, two years of my time just training, um, helping to train young commanders to get fit, pass the course, and go down to Limston, as you well know, where you finally get your green berry. And it's always very nice to be part of training people. And I'm still in touch with people today who said, you train my dad. You know, so it doesn't go away. You know, and that's exactly what happened. And two to nine commander of all artillery, if I'm not mistaken, nowadays, they're the only regiment in the army, um, which is um, Mandu Regiment. So they, as you well know, have got the batteries, you know, um, to support like some 40 commando, 4 one mm -hmm. uh, 4 commando, 4 5 commando and so on. They have a battery to support each 
and a forward operation uh, observation battery, um, which works very well. And once I got to 2.9, so it was a toss up whether I went to 2.9 Commando, 7 Para RHA. It was a toss up, and it was all down to football. When we met up for Gunners football, they wanted me to go down to Plymouth. Seven Para RHA lads, and they wanted me to go down to um, Aldershot. So I looked at the pair of them and I thought, where do I want to spend my time? I thought Aldershot wasn't really for me, but I would have done it. I thought, well, Plymouth, now I go to Plymouth and I'll do the commando course. And that's really what swayed it. So I could have been in seven para RHA or two nine commando um, RA. So when you think back on it, I think I made the right decision because from there things took off. Um, after I finished in two nine commando, didn't I'm thinking about three and a half years, something like that. Um, had a really good time, some good friends. And as you know, I only live up the road now. Um, and I meet some of them, and they've got reunions planned, you know, through the lockdowns finished. And things, you know, that have taken a while, but you don't forget, you don't forget your friends. And I'm still, I'm an honorary, honorary member of 2-9 Commando now, Sergeant Mess and WO's Mess. So I've got my own, my own car pass and my, my own everything so I can come and go. And it was very nice to be taken up there by the RSM and the others, taken into the mess and formally introduced to everybody. Um, so with lockdown out the way at the moment, to some degree, it'd be nice to get up there and say hello to them and have a brew again. So, and it's only 25 minutes, 20 minutes away from me anyway. So, and a great place to sit and go on the whole. Lovely, lovely place. And it's all, yeah, it's all been out since I was there, you know. Um, so it really is, you know, a, a, a lovely old um, citadel. It's a magnificent fortress, isn't it? And it is. So it's got one of the best views you'll have around there. Out onto the over the hole and out onto the sea itself. Lovely. How long will they keep hold of that then? When you think that the Marines have lost their their vitulin yard, so the um, down at Devil's Point, the um, Royal William Yard, that's been sold off and privatised, and now they're privatising Stone or selling off Stonehouse. Stonehouse as well. Yeah, I saw that. It, it's hard to say. Um, where they, the Marines seem to have, um, let's say, they had those areas you just talked about, including, I don't know about Bickley, you know, Bickley up the road, the training area up there, great training area. Not quite sure. I spent a couple of days in there um, going back into last year when we did an event. Um, and it's a nice camp as well. But what they're selling off, you never find out straight away, do you? It all comes like a headline in the newspaper, you know, that such and such is being sold. That it'd be a shame to get rid of the citadel, that's for certain. But you know, the way the money grabbers are, um, knows quite what's around the corner. If she don't. Yes, we're gonna have a further chat about this sort of thing, aren't we? Let's 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 save that for our for our next time but they're um they're sneaky fuckers these um pup people call them po politicians i call them puppets <laughs> <laughs> they're all puppets mate yes uh, it, they, they can't seem they've got to stay together because they're all puppets mate um you know i'll back him they've got no it seems to be they've got no sense even though we don't want to go in it on this one but we've got no sense of what should be done. What they want to do is they're quite happy to sit down and take the wages and just sign bits of paper, in my opinion. And then they wonder why the country's in such a mess. But we can talk about that on the next one. Yes, definitely. What was um what was your what's your sort of relationship, Rusty, with the with the guys through the years? Um is there much how can you say? 
Was there much bullying in the junior leaders if you all, all join at such a young age? No, no. Very little, you know, it, it was, it was, the bullying was before that. The junior leaders, you were far too busy to bully. A couple of the, um, you know, the sort of, the rank structure within the junior leaders, normally if you've been there, you just join. <clears throat> you still have people, lads there that will have been there in your battery. They might have been there 18 months because they haven't finished and gone to um, a unit. They're the ones that got one stripe, two stripe, maybe three stripes, or so on and so on. You could call it bullying if you wanted to say, why are you picking on me? I had to go and do this. I had to go and clean out the toilets. Well, if that's bullying, then everybody got bullied to some degree over the two years. In my opinion, it's just part. Somebody's got to do it. And it's, you know, if you if you wanted to use that as a bullying, it would be unfair. They've been there. They've started as a nig, new intake gunner. That's what they used to call them. Then they move for you know until they finally muster, and when they muster, they're allowed to wear a bayonet frog, you know, on their belt. And anybody who sees that, they go, "Oh, that lad's been here a couple of years. Better not upset him because he's only got a few weeks to go, and he's off to a, a man's unit, wherever that unit happened to be in those days." So <laughs> it's. I never felt I was uh, bullied in junior leaders. Um, you, might, you might think that guy's a better at swear than you. Um, but that's about it. it. It didn't, I don't remember it ever coming to the fisticuffs or anything within that two year period. When you, when you go into um, the SAS, Rusty, does it make you, um, I mean, something that was pointed out the other day on 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 the pod, podcast, I think it was Bob that was saying it, is if you go into the SBS, you're up until quite recently, you're all Marines. So it was quite quite a you know, you spoke the same language, you came under Navy law and Navy tradition and, and etiquette and all this sort of stuff, and 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 you all came under Marines operating procedure and lingo. But of course in the SAS it takes it takes from all across the forces or it's certainly all across the army back then does that make it interesting no um the, the thing is it's totally voluntary um the SCRC you don't get put on it you don't get told you're going on it you, you volunteer and then there's two courses a year you get one or the other you know and to be honest I think that really helps the makeup because We've got guys from all walks of life, such as the Intelligence Corps, Artillery, the Remy, the Cooks, I, I, I mean, um, the all sorts that, you know, come on the course, Arras, Commanders. They're all, or were, and had a few, a couple of ex-Marines. They came on the course and everybody fitted in together. But once you've passed and gone to your squadrons, you've got this makeup once you're in your squadron and troop within the squadron of, you need a jack of all trades, you ain't gonna get one, right? You might think you will, but you won't. But what you will have, if you've got a problem with the vehicle, I just go to Dave and said, Dave, he's an ex-vehicle mechanic, but he's now in the SAS. Mm -hmm. I want a bit of advice on something else. I'm going to speak to one of the lads who are ex intelligence corps, might be better. They've got ex paras there to speak to with their background and knowledge, but ex commanders there. You know, you've got all a different group apart from yourself. So you've got all these different guys, infantiers, you know. You, you want a job and a task, being given a task and a job. You've got generally when you sit down together, you've got all this knowledge, which makes it much easier. They weren't handpicked; they passed the course, and you ended up serving together. And that's what I think made the SAS one of the one of them be the best, in my opinion. I would say that. Um, I've got nobody to say it 
not many people would say it wasn't or isn't. Um, and I don't care if I'm around this day and age, but in my day, that was the makeup. And that's why we were quite so successful, because we knew how to get round obstacles to make whatever the mission was, achieve the mission. But you've got a lot of brain power there to delve into to help solve problems before you make the plan and before you, um, you know, you want the mission to be a success. So it's worth sitting down, getting all the brains together, come up, then you have to draw the plan up. The guys there that can execute the plan, whatever the plan happens to be. Mm -hmm. And that can only help achieve the mission. Which I can talk about. Can we talk about selection, M. Rusty? This seems to be a, a popular subject. I'm quite fascinated by selection because I didn't really get my yomping legs or tabbing le legs until I was 49. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, I ran the length of the UK carrying a full bergen full of all my camping gear and everything and and um and i i just made a goal of running a minimum of an ultra marathon a day so any anything over a marathon distance and by the time i got to um hereford so your neck of the woods or your your former stomping ground and that as you know some of the hills there there's 18 kilometers straight they just go up and up and up and up especially come, is it coming out of Mon monmouth that sort of area yeah. i might be exaggerating slightly I, I, I didn't like measure everything but i just remember running out of monmouth um and the hill went up so far that when you got to the top you were looking down looking down or looking across to the to the bridge hey up by hey hey on why oh. there's something up there to be honest, as long as my compass was pointing southish, um, I was just running, Rusty. I wasn't. I, I think my tracker on my phone was telling me wh which way to go, so I wasn't really that geographically minded. But I just remember running up this hill, nonstop, with a fifteen kilogram pack on, thinking I could never have done this when I was eighteen. Nah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> So when I think about selection, I, I've got like a different idea of it now. Yeah. To what, when people say, Chris, why didn't you go special forces? I say, because I wasn't good enough. <laughs> it was, to me, that was, it was, I just don't think I had what it, what it took, but, but you guys obviously realised that you did. Well, as I said, I've always been, uh, always was a sort of fitness fanatic. Um, I'd have to be to be playing football, rugby, and all the rest of the stuff uh, in a different way. But it came to a point when I was in 2 9 Commando, me and a couple of the lads, um, you know, we together and said, well, I think I might just go and try selection. I'm, I'm going to volunteer for it and put the paperwork through. And then some, some, someone comes in and says, right, Rusty, you're on the you're on the summer selection of 77. Now I didn't, I'd been there in 76 because I was on training wing in 2-9 Commando with gaps where there's no courses and stuff as you're well aware. Courses aren't there, 365 days a year. But I just asked, could I have a couple of weeks up in the, in those days it was, yeah, you know, nobody cared where you were. There was no mobile phones. There was nothing. You took your stuff up to the Brecon Beacons. And funny enough, even though I'd met John McAvee, he's a good friend of mine. Um, remember John with a moustache? I met, yeah, I met him on 2 9 Commando um, when we did the training. He was from 5 9 Commando Law Engineers. I was 2 9 Commando. Sorry, he ended up in 5 9 Commando um, up in our growth eventually, whereas I stayed on the training wing down in Plymouth. So we were miles apart. And then lo and behold, when I volunteered for selection, a few of us from 2-9 went. And while we were doing pre-selection in 76, that's when I met with John again, because he came down with some of the lads from 5-9. And 
they were doing pre-selection. I had no idea. Just total coincidence. No mobile phones. We weren't in touch every day. Um, but there we were, up a penny fan. They come up one side, we come up the other side. And we're back in friendship again. And we ended up doing summer of 77 selection. The hottest one ever on record, ever. There was no water at all in the reservoirs, none. Just cracks all the way. And if anybody remembers that, that was hard. But was, that, that, was that 76, Rusty? Or 77. Yeah, when we had the standpipes at the end of the street. Yeah, 77 was the, up in the Breckens anyway, I can tell you now that there was no water. <laughs> And in my book, it tells you when I used to take cans of cider and stuff with me. Not recommended, but hey, I wasn't going to find any water, and I'm not a great water drinker anyway. I used to take cans of beer up with me, cider in particular, and it goes in and sweat it straight out again. As I say, it's not recommended. Don't say Rusty told you, but that's what I used to do. It's all in my book. Um, and of course... We then ended up on selection together. And when we finally passed, John and I ended up in eight troop together in B Squadron, along with a couple of other guys, especially the guy I'm going to the funeral. We all ended on the same selection. We all ended up in the same troop. The troop we wanted together was Mobility Troop, which was eight troop and two, two SAS. So that's how we became really good friends after that, working together living together and we stayed all the way through until I did John's eulogy in 2011 you know when he passed away as well so it's you know memories are there and I wouldn't swap them I don't care what anybody says um, I wouldn't swap them for what I've done met some great people and I'm still meeting them now with what I'm doing this day and age so that, that's how we got in to, into selection and how we got into the squadrons where I spent, ended up spending 15 years in the SES. It's been unbelievable. What is it that makes you keep going then on this, on this, um, on the penny fan? What, what, when so many people, I mean, you, you, you can go on selection, what, with a hundred other candidates and and they whittle you down to maybe five or six that's been done in the past i've heard actually uh, uh, that um on one selection there was one guy got through i don't know how true that is but on mine yet again 77 i was very lucky because it was at the exact time that the parachute brigade was disbanding there was a lot of disgruntled ex uh, paras around and wanted something else some went out the army some decided and it was quite a big um, quite, um, quite a few of the um, paralads on, on our selection and it was 100 plus but we had a good pass rate because they, they said you know that the type of guys that were on that I think we had 20 or 30 I don't quite remember but some of them are right down in single figures or used to be I doubt it will happen this day and age because they need numbers in my day, um, and I don't like to say that, but in my day, you know, that, that's how it worked. And it seemed to work well. Um, the instructors want you to pass. They want you to become part of the regiment. Great set of guys, especially the ones that I can relate to, that I know. Um, the chief instructor was an absolute brilliant guy. And underneath him, everybody worked. They wanted you to pass. It's the individual who didn't quite come up to the mark. And you can't blame them, you know. At least they've had a go and tried. Okay, they've failed. But at least they've tried and failed. And then you find that the nucleus that goes through, every day you're sort of looking over your shoulder and seeing somebody else has gone, you know. But you are still focused on going straight up the middle. You're not actually bothered unless it's a good friend and you wonder why. And that's the way it went all the way through, um, you know, the um, first week, uh, first four weeks selection process, and then the jungle training and um, 
everything there was people disappearing all the time just couldn't quite make it maybe they thought it isn't for me after all this um, and that day one all the way through to the very last day when you finally get told that you've passed and you've gone into a squadron you don't give up until that until you know you, you've done that and then you're still not quite sure you're looking over your shoulder you know is there something else to come more or less you know but it's a day by day and all you wanted to do was survive and be there the following day and do that day in day out day in day out and unfortunately don't look back and forward and that's the way I approached it and a few of my friends approached it did what we told look at map read um physically I'm not being funny um it was hard but on the physical side um, I was I was okay with that. Um, they proved it on the final exercise when I took a wrong turn in. Um, when you're already doing 40 odd miles that day, I thought I knew the area so well, map in my pocket. But when the mist came down, you know, I quickly found it, but then I had to add on, I would say probably it doesn't sound much, probably a mile and a half or two miles. But when you don't know what the timings are, the adrenaline, you can feel it, you know, that's good. and then you end up starting passing people. When you start to pass them, it's great because you know you're back on track and you, you don't look back again. You just want to get to the very end where you're told that's your final RV. Even then you don't know if you passed because it's all timed. Only the instructors know finally who's passed. Even if 50 went over the line, it might only be 20 of them passed. And you're just hoping that you're in that group because that's what you've set your heart and soul into. And that's what you've done. And then you finally get told you've passed. Then you find that some of your mates have passed, but one or two might have got injured. Um, so they can come back on a week course. Injuries are not being booted off the course. You know, they're, they're expected on a course like that. Um, I know guys have broke their ankles. And, yeah, all through trying too hard. But they wanted that will to get there and come back. And yet, next time they came back, they passed some of them. So it's very interesting how it worked in those days. But... I can tell you now, as far as I remember, it was never a numbers a numbers game. Um, nowadays, they're struggling to find people. Um, lads that want to come and do it, but it has to be voluntary. Um, and now it's a big setup, much bigger than it ever was. Um, so I say best of luck to them because I wouldn't, I don't even think I'd fancy it these days the way it is. What, how is it these days then, Rusty? Can you enlighten us for, for our friends at home? I, I can only go by what I get told, you know, that it's such a big setup. I mean, in my day, everything was down in Sterling Lines or Bradbury Lines, small camp in the middle of Hereford. You know, four squadrons worth of guys. Then you had some TA squadrons um, out and about, which is still there. So it got so big, they had to move up to Cradnil, which is a huge ex um, RAF uh, base, RAF Craig Mill. I know that because I used to sneak over the fence there to go into the gymnasium uh, because I lived in Craig Mill at that time before I got married. And um, I knew the, the physical training instructor, huge place. That was all rebuilt. And now they've got a huge setup there, which isn't what I joined. I'm not saying they don't need it because they probably do, otherwise they wouldn't have done it. But when I joined and where I went to and the friends I had and where we live, and then the rebuild of Sterling Lines, I think that was open in 85. That's how I liked it. When I spoke to some of the guys now, and I'll be speaking to some um, tomorrow and Thursday, it'll be some of the stories about what they've heard and stuff will be interesting. But it wasn't. It wouldn't be for me now. I wouldn't even think that I'd want to be involved anymore. 
But that's only because I had a good time. And I would hate to go there now and say, I'll do it again and find that it just wasn't for me. Mm. I know what happens for me. What was it like going to the jungle for the first time? Um, The jungle was hard in Belize. I think it's secondary jungle, very, very hard, very dirty. Um, But once again, with the instructors we had, it was graft, hard graft every day. Soaking wet all day. If it's not sweat, it's rain. <laughs> it's simple. You know, so you sweat, sweat all the way through the day. I think then you're going to go into maybe get a decent night's sleep, which you never do. When trees falling down all over the place. You don't know where they are. Um, you know, it rains all night. Be four o'clock in the afternoon. Hence to peter off about first light ish or maybe just before. You put your wet kit back on and you start the day absolutely soaking. And then you've got the next part of whatever the job is. But it's not easy. You're not on tracks. You're going through the undergrowth. And it makes it very difficult. And, you know, you scavenge the water. There's plenty of water. But it rains every night. Um, food, it's limited because you can't carry that much. Because you've got everything else to carry. And, you know, you can't talk an awful lot and speak to people because it's in the jungle. That's what you're there to do. You're not there to gossip. So everything is discipline. You know, stop. Everybody would put their bashes up um, in the morning. You'd be up before first light, sat on your burgum, waiting to move. So it's all discipline and it's all what's been tried and tested. And a lot of people, lads who passed uh, the first four weeks of selection and stuff, through the hand in. They didn't like it. Lots of different reasons. But once again, um, it's not for everybody. Otherwise, everybody would do it. So it's another process. X number of guys go there, you can bet your life that when you finally get on the aircraft to come back to the UK, there's not as many on there than there was when you started. And that was general, you know. It's just not, the, you know, if it's not the snakes and the little creepy crawlies and, you know, um, if it's not them, it's the, all I can see is trees, <laughs> you know. A television, there's no nothing. That's it, you know. Um, but when you think back on, when you think back on it, when you finish it, you have to say, what's all the fuss about, really? Yeah, it's hard work. Yeah, you haven't got as many people that started it, and the lads that started, they're not there. And for different reasons, they've all decided as we called it, the jack, jack it in, not for me. With that, off, um, be taken off, so you're not talking to the other guys and trying to dissuade other people. So, be gone, you know. Um, in, in a funny way, I used to enjoy it. I've been back to Belize a number of times. I've been to Brunei. I've been, I've been to a lot of jungles. You know, a lot of different jungles, and they're all different. Um, and I just treat a jungle with respect. And I think if you treat it with respect, you, you're halfway to looking after yourself. You know, because there's a lot of funny things in the jungle. Don't bother them. <laughs> you know, um, they'll go away. You know. In Ferdy Lance, I always remember the snake, the Ferdy Lance. One of the lads tried to knock it, but they can jump. And people don't realise they can jump their own distance. <laughs> so if you're going to poke something over there, it can jump its own length towards you, and it ain't frightened. So you know what? It's there. Leave it. <laughs> Just leave it alone. 
they're hard to see, aren't they? They, they? When they're curled up, they're no bigger than that, and it's so easy to put your foot on. Yeah, well, I don't remember anybody actually standing on them, but I do remember people seeing them and trying to shoo them away. You know what? Just leave it alone. Just walk, walk around them. Yeah. Yeah. For people listening, it's it's one of the most poisonous snakes in the world. Yes. And the one that, that I saw was, um, well, I think I was in Venezuela, in the jungle in Venezuela, and it was, it was just sat, sat, I don't know, snake sit. It was lying there, coiled up, and you just wouldn't, had, our, had the Indian guy that I've been with not pointed it out, you, I wouldn't have seen it. Now they, you don't see them all by any means, but the ones you do see, you know what, leave them alone. Mm. Just, just leave them alone. It's not worth asking. How did you get on with the, the I'm going to call it airborne insertion, because if I call it skydiving, that sounds a bit sporty. I didn't, I wasn't in air troop. I was in my billing troop. So I didn't do any, um, the, the, three, the, the four troops, they're all methods of infiltration. The boat troop was mentioned, air troop, mobility troop, mountain troop. Well, I didn't do any, I did parachute, but I didn't do any any of the high stuff. Or, you know, that was left for the, for the troop lads who were in that. So I didn't, uh, you know, for me, I was in my troop and I was concentrating on doing what I do. Everybody has to parachute. But everybody has to do or didn't have to do the high stuff and they'll wear. But for those people who do it, it's a sport, you know, they love it. They do it in, in their own time as well. You know, everybody to their own mate. Yes. Did you but, like the did you like the paracourse? I did the paracourse when I was in two nine commando actually. Um and oh, it's nothing to it, really. I mean, anybody can come out with an aircraft. <laughs> you get shot a few things, how to, um, what to do, and, you know, dry training first, obviously, and all of that, how to do your roles and stuff. But, you know, the first one you do, you go up in the balloon. Some people don't like the balloons. They want to jump out of a balloon for some reason. Oh, bugger me, chaps. Bloody high here, isn't it? Right, okay. Into the door. Don't panic. Mummy loves you. Right. Don't look down. I said don't look down. Right. Put your arms across your bloody reserve. That's it, soldier. Wait, wait. Oh. Um. Once again, I, I don't know. You know, everybody's different. It's so quiet up there. And you've got somebody looking at you and there's a gate. <laughs> and then you're waiting for the gate to open so you can jump out. And the balloon is moving around because it's up 800, 1,000 feet, whatever. Um, so it, it isn't still, but everything there is still. So when they tell it's your turn, all you do is look up into the air and jump out. What's difficult about that? Um, but then once the shoe opens, you're laughing. If there's something goes on in between, you've been trained what to do with your reserve. So it was a, it, 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 it wasn't a big deal. And then the aircraft after that, the C-130s, even then we had C-130s. And jumping out of them, there's a oh, lovely jump out and slipstream takes you out. You know, yeah, it's nice. Either the back door, the tailgate, what side. It doesn't matter. It's, um, yeah, it's, I enjoyed it. I'd never pay my own money to go parachuting, you know, to do enough things in my life. But some people who do it, then they go and pay weekends to go parachuting somewhere. I've got other things to do. You now I play football on weekends and stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. We're lucky to have done the balloon jump because... It's gone now. They 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 jump from a Cessna caravan or a sky van, I believe it's called. Yeah, probably a sky van of some sort. No, it's um, it was a way of just, I suppose, jump out of that first. The people who jump out of an aircraft, they don't want to jump out of a balloon. <laughs> um, 
you know, horses for courses, I suppose. But yeah, it was a good one to start off on. Do a couple of them, and then go into the aircraft. Um, and then jump out of the aircraft. Yes. Make sure you don't land on a land on a Gurkha, from what I remember. <laughs> yeah. Or get tangled up with one. Yeah, there's yeah, lots of stories. Lots of stories. So I almost feel guilty asking you this because I I saw it in your chat with um with Dave Ellis the other day, and he said to you what what was the thing about the gloves? But I guess there's a lot of people have heard you referred to as the man with no gloves that don't actually, they've probably got an idea what it means, but don't actually know. Well, there I am behind me. You can see me there with no gloves. It's all in my book, Go, 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 the second book. If anybody wants it, it's called Go, Go, Go. Everything's on my website. We'll put links below for, so people can find that and, and buy it, Rusty. And the, the only thing with no gloves is... We were sat watching the snooker before we went in there. We were next door in 1415 Princess Gate or the Royal College of General Practitioners, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we were watching snooker. Um, you know, Cliff Thorburn was playing Alex Higgins in the final of the Embassy World Championship. Me and John McAleese and a few others were all avid snooker. We used to play snooker wherever we went in the world. If we could find a pool table, a snooker table. So we were just sat there, 1980. Um, and then, of course, normally, wherever we had a break, I'd put my gloves down my body armour. Somehow, I sat down at the table, had a, had a brew um, while we were watching the snooker, and I'd put my gloves onto the table instead of down my body armour at the front. And then we got the call out for the resolution, let's say, call it the resolution. They dumped Lavasani outside. They'd executed him, shot him three times. Once that happened, now don't forget, I'd taken over as team leader on this. Okay, so the guys on my team, blue team, my gloves on the table. We need to get outside because we've been told to get into our final assault positions, at which it took us 16 minutes to get into those positions, and then. Once I got outside, remember the guy's been executed. Margaret Thatcher was in power, thank God. And with that, it was get into position. You know, we're now, if they don't walk out now with their hands up, we're going to assault. The, the guy, Lavasani, he was the press attache inside the, the um, embassy. Um, they tied him to the stairwell and shot him three times. Once his body was put outside on the doorstep, which you see on the footage, that was proof of murder on UK soil. Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister. She then passed it on to our boss, get the guys ready. We all got into the position, on the top of the roof. I was down on the ground level, you can see there, the team. And the guys were on the balcony. And this was going to be a simultaneous attack. Once we got the go, 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 and the big um, distraction noise that you could hear at, right at the beginning, once we got that and in position, I'd go outside and realised I, I didn't have my gloves. But there's no way I could have gone back and collected them. So there was picture taken by the police snipers, that picture there. Um, go, 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 bang, in we go. 11 minutes, we clear the 54, 56 rooms. Um, we rescue 19 hostages. Five terrorists perished. One terrorist got out, all inside 11 minutes. And then we were all outside the building, accounting for everything within inside the 11 minutes. So it took 16 minutes to get into position because we wanted to do it covertly. We didn't want to be compromised. Lucky enough, we all got into position. 
apart from one semi-compromise, which is a boot going through a window just prior to the assault. That was on the second floor. And then we all entered and did whatever we had to do inside to achieve the mission, which is to rescue the hostages. And that's exactly what we did. I went back uh, with accounting for everything as the other guys did back next door. And I casually picked my gloves up off the table where I'd left them. Unbeknown that I'd been caught on camera, as you can see there, by a police sniper while I was gone into the building. So there's the story of the gloves. When I saw that picture, I just thought you were harder than all the rest of the boys. No, it definitely wasn't that, mate. There's some hard guys in that lot. Um, but no, it's just a circumstance. But if that picture had never been taken, arguably you wouldn't be sat here today talking. Rusty, do you do you think these guys that laid siege to the embassy? Do you think in their wildest dreams they expected that the SAS would come knocking? That that I mean, they wouldn't have known. They probably wouldn't have known who you were, would they? I doubt they'd have known. Even though all, all I can remember, and I wasn't privy to any more information whilst we were inside. All I can remember is that the when we were talking to Mac Thurman, he told me he's now just passed away a couple of weeks ago himself, the head negotiator. A good friend of mine used to talk with him. The only people they ever mentioned, what do you think the police will do now? What will the police do now? Mm. There's no mention of military that I'm aware of. And I've had this from the top. It, it was all, you know, what do you think the police are going to do now? Well, of course, Max was a policeman. Trevor Locke inside was a policeman. They wouldn't have any idea, I wouldn't have thought, that the neighbors from hell were next door waiting. And we were. They were in 16 Princess Gate. We were in 14 and 15 Princess Gate. And we were there mm -hmm. just waiting. And we've been there for six days, hence the film, Six Days, which comes from my book, Go, Go, Go. Yes, let's let's talk about that then. One question before we do. I'm guessing you're still in touch with some of the hostages? I've never touched bases with any hostages. I don't believe in it. If they ever spoke to me and said, I am such and such, and I'd be courteous enough to say something to them, I, as a professional soldier in my day, have never gone looking for the hostages to speak to. I don't think it's right. If for some reason we came face to face down the line, and it was um, fine. I don't have an issue with that. But I certainly haven't spoken to any hostages ever since 1980 to this day now. Wow. I've never really seen them in the public eye. I've seen, um, obviously, I've seen um, the film Six Days, and I've seen a few of the documentaries that are made with people like Trevor Lockin. Yep. I can't remember them massively focusing on the hostages i can't remember many being interviewed now i don't know who's interviewed any of them um i don't even i'm just trying to think now uh now i mean they would have had a debrief at the time i'm certain of that um by who um probably the spooks and maybe the military but you're right any of the documentaries i've done quite a few different ones you've probably seen there's never been any mention of um, getting hostages. And I, I can only think that they, they probably don't want to be interviewed. I'm sure if they wanted to, they could be interviewed at any time. I'm certain of that. What's your thoughts then, Rusty? Because you're all ready to go. Like you said, you prepared for six days. Everyone's you know, fired up, all the preparations are in place, you're running on adrenaline, and you're about to put your, what might be your life on the line for the very last time. 
And just as you're going in, the BBC broadcast your secret to the to the whole world. What what was all that about? Well, I don't know. You know the, <laughs> you know, the BBC are like. You know, at the end of the day, there was no televisions inside the embassy that I'm aware of um, that were working. Um, and that's exactly what they would do. Don't forget they've been sat outside there themselves from day one. You know, just down, if you come out the front of the embassy and turn left, down the, the row of, um, past the Ethiopian embassy and so on. They were down there from day one, like cameras glued, you know, to the balcony front. There wasn't, apart from the police snipers who took that at the back of the building, um, I didn't see any film crews ever. They weren't allowed access into there. Um, so out the front, you can imagine they've waited six days and this huge bang goes off, smoke pillowing up in the air, billowing even. Um, and then you would hear the gunshots and stuff. And of course, this is when the cameras point onto the balcony and the four guys on the balcony there are seen putting a charge on, firing it, going through the window, looking after Sim Harris, so, you know, uh, making sure he was okay, threw him outside, picked him up later on. Everything was taken care of. And of course, the cameras picked it up. Don't forget this, and it's in my book, that we had eight guys at the front, eight, two sets of four, with smoke generators. And the idea was if we went in, these guys would blow the smoke generators, our guys, that would obliterate all the film crews. They wouldn't be able to see a thing. Okay, this was part of the plan. And then somewhere, I didn't know, until I came out. And when I came out, I found out, we saw it. The first time we saw that first footage was at Regent's Park Barracks after we got there to meet Maggie Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, and Dennis Thatcher, William Whitelaw, the Home Secretary. They all come up to say thanks and everything. We saw it. We're thinking, what happened to the smoke generators? Is actually Mrs. Thatcher had somehow passed a message not to blow the smoke generators. We want to show the world how we deal with terrorists. Right? What a statement that is. What if it had gone wrong? That's the kind of prime minister she was. Yes. Made to the guys. It ain't going to go wrong. So you weren't supposed to see anything. The world has seen it and witnessed it. And we didn't really have a lot of terrorist incidents after that, I remember. We went to much easier places. Yes. Was this, um, Rusty, this was... This was before the Gibraltar petrol station. <clears throat> um, what do we call that? Shooting. Yeah. That, that was a bit later in the 80s, wasn't it? That was about 80, 80, 87, was it? Yeah. Did you know? Did you know that team? Were you anything to do with that? Because of the investigations, and of course, I know a lot about it. But because there's investigations on everything at the moment, Northern Ireland, this, that, the other, it's best to forget about that one at the moment until it's sorted. And that way, there's no compromise anywhere. Nobody can say, well, such and such. It's better just to let that one run its course because we, we can see what's going on. And I, I don't really want to comment in the morning. I don't want to comment in any more at the moment. Yeah, no, good, good point. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, the film then, how was it working with a with a director and a producer and a and a film crew? Was that a, was that a fun experience or was that challenging? No, 
when I first met them, you know, you get a first impression of somebody. Um, I went to London to meet the um, producer, <coughs> um, Matthew, Matthew Metcalf. And then eventually I met the, the director and also Glenn Sandrin. He was the scriptwriter for six days on Netflix right now. When I met them all, I was totally comfortable because we talked about the film, which some people said was long overdue, it should have come out ages ago, but it came out in 2017. And they said quite clearly that we will go, basically, I took them, took the script writer with me to Hereford, met some of the guys who took part, let him have a chat with them and make some notes. So it wasn't just me. I was the advisor, but I wanted other guys to tell their stories. So he's a script writer. So we spent five days in Hereford, um, you know, and that was great because he got a feeling, I showed him everything where the old camp was, you know, the camp, everything um, took him around, introduced him to people. I didn't, when he was interviewing or speaking to them, I just sat up to one side of, um, and let me get on with it. So it started off well. And then, of course, when they're picking the cast and stuff, but Jamie Bell, who plays me in the film, great, 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 great actor, and what a quick learner. And then, basically, once that was all set up, they had the script done, they sent me the script about three or four times to have a look at, updated. Um, what do I know about film scripts? <laughs> but they were good enough to do that. And then all of a sudden it was um, hitting equipment. They got as much stuff as they could, replicas. And they're going to do filming in New Zealand and filming in London. So I went to New Zealand after a few weeks where I met up with Jamie Bell and taught him how to become me and helped with the stuntmen and some of the actors, the way we used our weapons in those days um, to give them a reality side. And then I'd take Jamie Bell one-on-one -on -one with me and then part of the team, two guys and four guys, just like the guys going in the, the window there. So I did all that with him in New Zealand and it was good fun. Hard work, started very early in the morning, finished late at night. And that's what we did. Uh, we had good facilities there. Um, I did a presentation for the New Zealand SAS as well on the siege. I got invited into the barracks. I did that for them in the barracks while I was there. Yeah, so all in all, it was good. And when we came back, they did the last of the filming down in London, where I went down to London and what was going on basically. And I thought everything um, everything done. Uh, they took me down to London. I looked at the first showing of it. Uh, six days. It was with another company at that time. Then something happened. Then there's a bit of a break. And eventually it ended up coming out on Netflix in November 2017. Um, they did a few changes. And I thought all in all, but it, and if you look at the any of my pages and stuff, the people who've seen it and watched it, some have watched it 10 and 12 times, you know, so it tells you a story. Yeah, you get the odd person um, who doesn't like it, but in the main, I've got far more uh, people that think it's a great film. Uh, and there's no Hollywood in it. That was one of the stipulations. There's no Hollywood. Um, these were for the New Zealand Film Corporation, uh, all of them, who did the film. And they did it more or less, um, I thought, there's a couple of things you could pick up, but the normal person ain't going to pick up on it anyway. So it's not worth worrying about. But it is a film at the end of the day. You have to understand. If you get a chance, watch it on Netflix. Six days, numeral six days. Yeah, my only criticism of Jamie Bell is I don't think he was handsome enough, mate. 
Oh, I agree. I told him. So I'll give him a facelift. Um, he's, he's only human, though, Rusty, isn't he? Well, I can tell you a story, shall I? He's a dancer, right? He's a dancer. Billy Elliot and all that stuff, which I never knew. Until they, once he... He wasn't the first choice at one stage. There was another guy. Um, he tried... I think I thought he was trying to be greedy. Anyway, they got rid of him and got Jamie. And I was in New Zealand with him. <laughs> and I was teaching him the 9 millimeter pistol, high browning, uh, high power browning. I was teaching him how to hold it, shoot it, and all this type of stuff. And he couldn't quite get it right because his feet moved like a dancer. Now, nobody's going to pick that up on the film. But I'm saying to him, look, Jimmy, just do this. You're an actor. You can learn Sure enough, he gets it more or less right. Not a problem for him. But then you take your eyes off him for five minutes and he's gone back to this. He said, Rusty, look, I've spent all my time, he's really serious, dancing. You know, I've done this, I've done ballet. And I said, Jamie, how about this? Just remember this. He's like, what? Rusty, don't. I think dance. He got it. He got it. He got it, mate. Rusty, don't dance. <laughs> Rusty, don't anything dance. We need to get that T-shirt made up. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's a fact. It, mm. That brought it home. Can we talk about Lewis Collins? Because I believe he was a friend of yours. No, he's not a friend of mine. I met him. Um, he used to come to the camp. He used to say he just wanted to know how the SES. Basically, he just wanted to come and get pissed with the lads. Um, simple as that. So I met him in the camp a couple of times. Um, Soldier Eye, Pete Winner, the South. Just keep an eye on what he's doing. Make sure he's okay. Just leave him alone, basically. Just make sure that he's not making a dick of himself, which he didn't. You know, he, he got drunk with the guys. It was simple. But that was the uh, the paladrin club that used to be in the camp in those days. That was our social club. Wednesday and the Saturday, I think it was. But he'd want to come up. Um, first of all, he was an actor and well known, and um, a decent bloke. Um, and there was a few lads, including myself, who asked, "Keep an eye on what's going on." You know, we're artists anyway. You know, um, so it, it, there was no hassle ever. He just another guy in the club with other guys and women and beer, and the rest is history. Nice, nice guy. Yeah, I was chatting to one of his friends a couple of days ago, actually, um, a chap called Mark Ryan, who in the film uh, Who Dares Wins plays one of the bad guys, the guy with a shock of black hair and a black black beard. Right. Mark, Mark is now the voice of Bumblebee in the Transformers um, movie series. I uh, had a good old chat with Mark, and I said to him, what was the score then, Mark, with Lewis? Because people on my podcast are always saying different stuff. Was he in the TASAS, this kind of stuff? Was he? And Mark said that he got injured, I think, on his first para course to becoming TA para. I, I believe I might, I might have this wrong. But then he went back and completed the course. And then I think he was... He was going to be a reservist in the SAS, but his notoriety was too, he was too well known. More or less, what I, that's what I know of him as well. It's a TA, um, Paris. And then I think possibly there's a well known face, actor, whatever, whoever decided, decided that, you know, that he wasn't going to. First of all, fit in when he got there, really. No, I don't mean fit in as a person, but because of his, um, what he was, his standing in those days, maybe it was too high a profile. Mm. Um, I haven't seen it written down anywhere, but the stories I've heard would fit in with what you're saying quite well. Yes. It's part of the reason I wish I'd never started a podcast is I'm, I'm probably too high profile now to join. Maybe next year. Obviously, 
Rusty, what about uh, the Falklands? What 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 were you doing at that time? Well, the Falklands it was. I when you think about it, it was now, back in nineteen eighty two. Started in April, finished in June the fourteenth. Mm. Um, I was doing a language course um, in camp. I was doing a Portuguese language course. Um, when we were told, right, that's it, it's finished. We got a job. <laughs> Some of the lads had already gone down south. Um, we were taken off the course, pre squadron then prepared, and eventually ended up um, down south as well. Well, we went on to the island um, and then hung about doing training and everything else for something specific, which ended up being a, was going to be an attack from the Argentina mainland, um, which could have been a, quite a disaster. But we did all the training for it and stuff, and then um, we. The job we were going to do to start with, that was sort of binned and sidelined because there was all sorts of well, what was going on. You know, we had that, then we had the, the helicopter crash there, which anti labs perished in that. Now things changed, and our job was to attack the mainland and then kill the pilots that were flying the super Etendards. Um, trying to get the exercise missiles that were left, I think there was three of them, and then I packed the aircraft so they couldn't fly them, whatever pilots we could get hold of, um, and then escape to Chile on foot or by whatever. And it's cutting a long story short, obviously, again, it's all in my book, the Regiment 15 in the SAS, and actually, in there. It goes into great detail of what happened on the, on the flight, the disasters that lead into the kit when you're going to parachute into the South Atlantic. You see all your kit go to the bottom of the Atlantic as you jump out behind it, not knowing who's going to pick you up. Freezing <laughs> cold, um, 16 foot waves, snowing at times when we jumped out of the aircraft. It's all highlighted very, very much in the book. So, and the attack would have probably been a disaster. We lost um, our advance wrecking crew. Um, they got compromised, so we wouldn't have had anybody on the ground. And eventually, the operation was pulled. And once again, I was told it was by Mrs. Thatcher, uh, who was still Prime Minister at the time. But um, yeah, we only had one aircraft anyway. The other aircraft had to turn around with half a squadron on and go back. Hours carried on, and we ended up jumping into the Atlantic and taking on board onto the boats, and giving a short run. Some new kit, because we didn't have any kit or weapons at the bottom of the Atlantic. Um, we had to wait for one of the squadrons coming out so we could take their weapons off them. And then, go. And then the war ended on the 14th of June. It's a detailed account about Mikado, Mikado, um, which is all in the book. Yes. And I'll just say again, friends at home, uh, there'll be a link below for, for Rusty's book. So if you want to want to grab yourselves, yourselves a copy. And um, the Portuguese, Rusty, was that to go into Angola or Mozambique by any chance? Or me, never got told that. So if you're on a Portuguese course. Um, you have to get the language done first. It's only, it's, um, what would you call it? Just the basic. And, and then, depending where the job would have come up, but like I did the Arabic course and the Malay course, you know, it's, um, it was just another course, really. But we, ne we never did finish it. <laughs> so, uh, it was that. Yes. Rusty, just to clarify, did you jump into the Falklands or are you talking about the regiment as a... as a yeah. B squadron. Uh, there was different 
different squadrons had different jobs. We went from um, Tiananmen Corps, where we're it's just in my memory. Anyway, we flew a C-130, two C-130s took off with a squadron, half a squadron in each. Mm. One of the aircraft had a fault, turned around and went back. Um, we carried on and the ships were on the exclusion zone around. And our job was to jump in to the Atlantic and be picked up and then taken onto the boats. I can't remember if it was Andromeda, one of them was such a mess. And then once we were on board there, we were preparing for another task, but we were half a squadron missing at that stage. Yes. So, yeah, we, we, we jumped in, not directly onto the Falklands itself, but the boats that were on the exclusion zone, just on the edge. And we, once we were on there, we were then transferred to the, was it the RFLs and stuff. Um, but we still half a squadron missing. And they never did show up. Mm. But well, the war ended up finishing before we actually got into the last house. What's it like jumping into the South Atlantic then? <laughs> it's quite funny. They, I, I'm, I'm sure they said, um, oh, we'll, we'll jump from 1,000 feet today instead of 800 because visibility wasn't very good. Um, as you were going down and the door opened, the, basically the idea was to throw your kit out in pallets and then stick a guys would jump out behind that so hopefully they would end up in the same area, make it easy for the people picking you up. Because you can imagine the waves just wiped down below. <clears throat> so when we jumped out, when we saw the shoot, uh, the, the pallets go out with all our kit and equipment on, and the shoot went one way and the pallets went gone. Just out after them. Um, and that happened until we got rid of everybody that was on the aircraft basically with their kit and equipment. So that happened. <laughs> but nobody had any kit and equipment when they got there. The only thing that was actually found of mine, you know the old para bag? You know the yes. wrap you shoot up in? Yeah. They found that. But they found other people's kit, but all the weapons and stuff, the heavy stuff is gone. And it brought mine back and all mine had a yeah, you go on say it had a blue track suit in <laughs> there. Sport, it had a blue tracksuit in there. This was for wearing on board and stuff like that. The jumper, everything I didn't need was in the para bag. All my Bergen and my personal belt kit, my weapons were at the bottom of the South Atlantic. So I was walking around on board. We know the white, the Navy pullovers with the white collars and stuff on. I was walking around with all that type of stuff on, you know. Um, until we got kitted out again, because all I had was what I stood up in inside the dry bag, as they called it. It's, you know, you never survive in the Atlantic without it. Um, and then you just bob around. Then you see the guy, see a knife coming up on my shoulder. You know, because you've got your life jacket on me like that. Um, I saw the knife and he just, Slip the life jacket and then pull us up through the life jacket in the corner, so in the corner of the um, rubber Gemini type boats. And they bob around and pick somebody else up and then look around back to the boat, climb up the side of the boat. They go and pick everybody up. The thing was, everybody did get picked up eventually, but they were dotted all over the place. So we didn't lose anybody, but. Um, Quite an experience actually because as you jumped out you could see the snow and then there'd be a gap you could see a boat but then once you were through that and you throw your reserve chute away it was okay because it was just water but cold <laughs> so that's the experience man. i wouldn't pay to do it either but somebody will leave that to the taxpayer they they, they pay that one for you Yes. Rusty, it's been absolutely uh, brilliant chatting, extremely enlightening. Um, I'll put, put your links below the video. 
And the um, can you put my website on there as well? Yes, of course. We're going to um, liaise with David Ellis, aren't we, and have a chat about what we could perhaps talk about. Yeah. Um, ne- 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 next week, with respect to. Um, We're just waiting for the firm. What happens, as we mentioned? Yes, we, and we'll we'll talk about the the NI veterans then as well, shall we? Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Massive thank you again, Rusty. Um, to all our friends at home, big love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you could like and subscribe. And thank you so much to everyone who supported the pa- Patreon. It's that link at the bottom of the screen. It's just one ninety nine a month, folks, to keep these stories alive, to support our veterans, um, to... Maintain our freedom, can we say? And many of you have, have come on board. Pay that one ninety nine to let us keep the channel going. So thank you for that. If you pay instantly, there's loads of perks. You get all my books wherever they are up there um, for free in ebook, and you get the chance to come as VIPs free of charge to my annual talk. And uh, that's it. Massive thanks again to Rusty. See you soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you.